For 66 years, the wreck of HMS Prince of Wales held a secret that challenged the official story of its sinking. It was not a barrage of torpedoes that doomed the modern battleship, but a single, perfectly placed hit. Marine forensic surveys of the wreckage reveal a catastrophic failure point deep within the ship's engineering spaces, a flaw that turned a technological marvel into a sinking tomb in just over an hour. This is the story of how a precise strike sealed the fate of a battleship and marked a permanent shift in naval warfare. What put her there begins with the decision to send a visible symbol of British power to the Far East, the bold gamble of Force Z. The deployment of HMS Prince of Wales to Singapore in late 1941 was a calculated political maneuver. Winston Churchill and the Admiralty intended the modern battleship's presence to serve as a powerful deterrent against Japanese expansion in the Pacific. They believed that even a single capital ship, representing the peak of British naval engineering, would project sufficient force to alter Japanese strategic calculations. This was a direct response to Japan's military consolidation in French Indochina, a move that directly threatened British colonial interests in Malaya and Singapore. This strategic gamble, however, critically underestimated the capabilities of Japanese naval aviation and the evolving nature of warfare at sea. The original plan for the force, designated Force Z, included the aircraft carrier HMS Indomitable to provide essential air cover. That plan was derailed on the 3rd of November, 1941, when Indomitable ran aground in Kingston Harbor, Jamaica, then underwent 12 days of repair at Norfolk Navy Yard. With no replacement carrier available, the decision was made to proceed without this crucial element. Admiral Sir John Tovey, commander of the home fleet, had voiced strong objections to sending the new King George V-class battleships to tropical regions citing specific concerns about their ventilation systems and machinery in the humid climate. These technical reservations were overruled. Intelligence reports circulating at the time explicitly warned of strong Japanese land-based air power operating from bases in Indochina. The Japanese had reinforced their bomber forces with 36 Mitsubishi G4M land-based bombers crews trained specifically for ship-killing torpedo attacks, an unprecedented focus in 1941. Despite these warnings, Admiral Sir Tom Phillips, newly promoted to full admiral on the 1st of December and appointed commander-in-chief of the Eastern Fleet, proceeded with the mission. He believed that Japanese aircraft would be ineffective at long range and that his battleships were relatively immune to air attack. This miscalculation reflected a broader, prevailing doctrine within the Royal Navy that still placed the battleship at the apex of naval power. The supremacy of the big gun was an article of faith. On December 8th at 5.10 p.m., the ships sailed from Singapore, heading north into the South China Sea, to locate and disrupt Japanese invasion convoys bound for Malaya. The absence of adequate AIR cover was a known and accepted vulnerability from the outset. Force Z advanced into waters within reach of trained bomber crews. Two days later, the test of that doctrine arrived, on time and from above. 10 Minutes to Doom begins at a precise moment on December 10, 1941, when the geometry of attack and defense finally intersected over gray seas. At 11.40 a.m., the first torpedo attack developed. The battlecruiser Repulse, under Captain William Tennant, threw the ship into sharp turns and, for the moment, slipped the pattern. For HMS Prince of Wales, the outcome was different. One of 17 Mitsubishi G3M Nell torpedo bombers from the Genzen Air Group broke through the anti-aircraft umbrella and steadied for a stern approach. The torpedo ran true and struck the port side aft, right where her outer port propeller shaft exited the hull. To an observer, the single hit might have seemed manageable on a ship of such size and armor. The visible blast pattern was localized. Inside, the effect was catastrophic.
the warhead detonated beside a densely packed engineering space, a junction never meant to absorb such force. The underwater explosion deformed the stern tube, the precisely machined housing that lets the shaft pass through the hull while maintaining a watertight seal. The seal failed. The still rotating shaft, suddenly unsupported and out of alignment, began to tear itself apart. Flanges sheared under torsion, metal buckled. This failure ripped open the shaft tunnel, containing the propeller shaft. Seawater surged into the cavity under pressure and drove forward. From the shaft tunnel, it broke into adjacent compartments. It poured into the B engine room and the Y engine room through compromised bulkhead glands, the seals around cable runs and piping that pierce watertight bulkheads. The impact was immediate and measurable. Prince of Wales took an 11.5 degree list to port and her speed fell to roughly 16 knots. The progressive flooding was uncontrollable. The sequence bypassed armor entirely and attacked the ship's integrity at a vulnerable junction deep in the unarmored stern. Damage control parties moved fast, but they were fighting the hull itself. Water was entering through a failed shaft system that no pump could isolate. In the minutes that followed, the consequences of that breach moved beyond flooding and into the lifeblood of the ship. The cascade of failure began with power and propulsion unraveling together. The flooding of the shaft alley initiated a domino effect that crippled the battleship's vital systems. The outer port shaft was wrecked at the strike point. Debris and violent misalignment, it damaged the inner port shaft as the outer shaft broke away. Both port shafts went down, only the starboard engines remained operational, and they were boxed in by rising water and failing auxiliaries. Seawater surged into the electrical switchboard rooms located near the flooded engine spaces. Saltwater contacting high-voltage equipment caused massive short circuits. This event cut all electrical power to the aft half of the ship. The consequences were immediate and devastating. The steering gear, which relied on electrical power, failed completely. The ship lost the ability to maneuver. Its speed dropped rapidly as the swamped B and Y engine rooms ceased to function. A pronounced list to port developed, further hampering any defensive efforts. Damage control parties faced an impossible situation. Without electrical power, the main pumps were inoperative. Lighting failed throughout the stern compartments, leaving men to work in darkness. The rapid spread of water through compromised bulkhead glands made containing the flood a futile task. Each watertight door they secured was undermined by leaks through cable and pipe penetrations. Ventilation systems also failed with the loss of power. The engine rooms quickly filled with smoke from electrical fires and fumes from shorting batteries. The atmosphere became toxic, forcing engine room crews to abandon their posts to avoid asphyxiation. This abandonment sealed the fate of any attempt to restore propulsion. Internal communications broke down. The ship's telephone circuits, sound-powered phones, and amplified voice systems depended on electrical distribution that was now gone. Coordination between damage control teams collapsed, and the bridge could not assemble a coherent picture of what was failing and where. Confusion compounded every minute. By 1210, the crew hoisted the out-of-control signal, Within 10 minutes of that first torpedo hit, HMS Prince of Wales was a mobility kill. It was a heavily armed fortress, adrift and defenseless. Its main armament remained intact, but the ship could no longer position itself to bring its guns to bear. The subsequent attacks by Japanese aircraft merely confirmed a fate already sealed. Around 1220, a second torpedo attack put three more fish into the starboard side. The counter-flooding effect eased the port list, but shattered remaining boundaries and accelerated the end. What happened next would be debated for decades, until the wreck itself offered a final, silent account. Attention shifted from the chaos of the attack to the cold record on the seabed, the wreck's silent testimony. For decades, the official record maintained that HMS Prince of Wales succumbed to a massive assault, 
overwhelmed by multiple torpedo hits. This narrative suggested the ship was simply battered into submission by sheer volume of enemy ordnance. It was a resting place for the crew, but it did not immediately yield its secrets. The ship lay upside down in 68 meters of water. Its port side, the site of the critical first hit, buried deep in the seabed mud. This position made a thorough examination of the initial damage impossible with the technology of the time. The breakthrough came in 2007 with a dedicated marine forensic expedition. Expedition Job 74, led by Kevin Denlay, mounted 47 dives using mixed gas and closed-circuit rebreathers to extend bottom time and work methodically around the stern. Equipped with advanced sonar and remotely operated vehicles, the team conducted the first detailed archaeological assessment of the hull. Their mission was to map the damage with precision, creating a high-resolution digital model of the wreckage. They focused on the stern, where survivors reported the first torpedo had struck, and meticulously documented the twisted metal and shattered structures. The forensic evidence they gathered was conclusive. The imagery revealed the port outer propeller shaft was fractured at multiple flange joints and violently displaced from its housing. Approximately 17 meters of shafting aft of the last intact joint had broken away with the propeller and strut. The stern tube receptacle, the crucial component designed to keep the sea out, showed clear signs of being torn apart from the inside. The metal was deformed in a manner consistent with an internal explosion, followed by the uncontrolled rotation of the damaged shaft. This was not damage caused by an external impact alone. The path of destruction was unmistakable. Flooding propagated inward from this single, catastrophic failure point. Water first filled the shaft tunnel, then forced its way into the adjacent engine rooms through damaged bulkheads. The 2007 survey also confirmed there was only one torpedo hit on the port side, not the multiple impacts long assumed. Follow-up dives in 2008 and 2009 included penetration of the shaft tunnel, producing photographic evidence of internal damage unseen since the day she vanished into the deep. The wreck overturned a familiar story. It exposed a precise vulnerability and how air-delivered torpedoes could exploit it. What that meant for naval warfare would soon become undeniable. The loss of HMS Prince of Wales signaled more than the sinking. It was more than the loss of a single warship. It marked a decisive turn against the battleship era. For the first time, capital ships maneuvering and defending at sea were sunk solely by air power, distinct from Pearl Harbor's anchored targets. The event demonstrated the vulnerability of surface fleets to coordinated air attack and reshaped naval strategy. Combined with Pearl Harbor two days earlier, the disaster left the Allies with only three operational carriers in the Pacific. The wreck is a designated war grave, and Royal Navy ships passing overhead still hold remembrance services in silence.